I guess you'd call it Passover Eve. Passover's tomorrow. Thanks, Lynn. Um, so today we're just going to concentrate on Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb. Right, it's all about Jesus. And, and we can look forward. Passover looks forward. But praise God, Jesus has said it's finished. So we look back at the cross. We look back at the resurrection. We look back at what Jesus has done. But before I start this, I want to give you an example of what a Goshen looks like. So a lot of you may know the story of the um, transformation videos. Anyone seen the transformation videos? Yeah? <clears throat> well, there's an update on Alma Longa. So I'll just read all of it. This is out of a book by Geoffrey Toussaint, Gregory Toussaint, called Diamonds in the Desert. Alma Longa was a village of extreme poverty in the 1970s. Witchcraft, idolatry and occultism were common practices. The inhabitants worshipped a wooden idol called San Simon or Santa Murta, which is the spirit of death. Violence was extremely high. And even though it had a population of under 18,000 back then, they had so many jails. It was a dangerous place to go. Domestic violence was also a big problem. A young lady testified when she cooked, if her husband didn't like the food, he'd beat her and throw her out of the house. The land was sterile and the mountains that surrounded it looked like heat scorched desert. One day gangsters caught a pastor who had a church in that town by the name of Mariano. They put the barrel of a gun in his mouth and in his heart he prayed for divine intervention. When the hammer fell, the gun did not fire. Emboldened by his experience, Mariano went to his small church and called them to pray and he said to them, the word of God says we are the head and not the tail. We cannot be in this village and not have an impact. So they started to organise prayer services and crusades and the men in the village who were mostly alcoholics uh, started to give their lives to Jesus. The gospel restored their families. Many people experienced healing and deliverance and churches started to grow. The violence steadily declined and in 1994, the local authorities decided to close the last remaining jail they had in town because there was um, no one to arrest. How's that? No one to arrest. And when they have a prayer meeting, 98% of the population turn out in the public square to pray. Um, the the uh, farmers who were like so broke now drive Mercedes-Benz trucks and they pay cash for them, yeah. right? Uh, the most amazing aspect of the transformation was the land. Suddenly the mountainous desert started to bloom. The land became fertile and started to produce fruits and vegetables in biblical size and quantity. If you've seen the transformation videos, the size of the carrots are like the size of a man's arm. Cauliflowers are like, it's just like I've never, you can, after you've seen the, the transformation video, you can then believe what they said about carrying grapes out on a cluster on a pole between two men, you know. Um, the size of a carrot, like I said, in that land is bigger than a human arm. The farmers, then now remember, this was poor land. And before God's presence came, they harvested maybe once a year. But then they started to harvest every four months. And now they harvest every 28 days. So every month there is a full harvest. They used to export four trucks of vegetables a month. Now they export 43 truckloads a week. And scientists from different parts of the world flew to study the, flew to study the techniques of the farmers of Alma Longa. And when they asked them for their secret, they got an unexpected answer, Jesus. The prophet Jeremiah says, from our earliest years, shameful gods have eaten up everything our people worked for. However, when Jesus comes to town, not only does he give us hope for eternity, but he changes our poverty into prosperity. So, um, you know, from 
what was it, four trucks of vegetables a month to 43 truckloads a week. This is the power of the presence of God. This is a Goshen, right? This is what we're talking about, supernatural provision, supernatural protection, things that cannot be explained in the natural. That was what, that was what Goshen was. They could not explain why Goshen was protected from the plagues that went through Egypt. Like it was just like we can't explain it. There's no real reason for it except God. And so this is the Goshen, this is the redemption that we have through Jesus Christ. This is what his blood paid for. And so when we start to recognize it's the power of his presence in our life and on our life, and as we start to release that into the circumstances around us, you are going to see things change. So Bill Johnson spoke last week. I don't know whether it was at the conference or whether I saw it on something. I don't know, but it was Bill Johnson. And he was explaining that he's pretty good at killing plants. There was one plant in his office that survived, but it drank coffee. If he had any coffee left over in his coffee cup, he'd give it coffee and the plant survived. He said he don't, doesn't think it ever had pure water. It was just like the dregs of the coffee. But in his wife's office, Benny's office, you know, she went home to be with the Lord some time ago. He said there was a plant that flowered every November. But then it started to flower December, January, and it flowers every month. And it's supposed to flower once once a year. So I was talking about this with a pastor I know in Queensland, and they were saying that they love orchids, and they propagate orchids, and they... You know, they just love orchids. And when it's orchid season, their house is full of orchids and it's on their front patio and they're everywhere. But they're saying, and there's a section in their front patio where not every day, but the majority of their time with the Lord is in that area. Those orchids flower after the season ends. Those orchids continue to flower. So we're entering into something right, which is supernatural, which goes beyond description, which is the power of an almighty God, which is the power of the God that we serve, the one who raises the dead, causes blind eyes to see, makes the deaf to hear, the one who turns families around, the one who tracks down the prodigal son and races out to meet them. That that God, that amazing father, he is on the move and we can either step into alignment with him and what he's doing or we can stand by and go, wow, doesn't that look amazing? Look what God is doing, but not get in on the action. And there is an invitation that is being extended out. There's an invitation that's being released uh, for those of you who want to get in on the action because God is looking for participants and not spectators. He doesn't want us to sit on our backside. Sorry, blessed assurance. He doesn't want us to sit on our blessed assurance and just say, wow, look what God is doing. He wants us to be a participant in it because it took uh, Peter, and it was it Peter and John, to heal the man with the, the, the cripple at the, the beautiful gate. Every time God does something, he does it through people. In Alma Longa, he did it through the people. He did it through the pastor, did it through the church. You know, and when we start to take hold of our identity, when we start to take hold of the fact of who we are in Christ, that we are complete in Christ, let me tell you something right now. I've had lots of time to just spend some time with the Lord, lots of times to just like, oh God, I'm vegging looking at the telly. But you know, but I've had lots of time But one of the things that has struck me is that we are still living a lot of the times Old Testament instead of stepping fully into the new. So we all claim Psalm 91 as a psalm of protection. And it rightfully is. But what covenant is it? It's an old covenant. So the thing is, I don't live under the shadow of him. I live in him. That's the New Testament. I abide in him and he abides in me. The Old Testament is the shadow. The Old Testament points to what Jesus is coming to do. But the New Testament says, look what he's done and what is your response? 
The Old Testament was all about how we could respond, how many sacrifices, what we could do, you know, all of that kind of stuff to get God's attention or we had to do the turtle dove or the lamb or the scapegoat offering or the whatever. But in the New Testament, Jesus fulfilled everything and, and, and God, the Father's looking, Abba, Daddy, God is looking to say, how are you going to respond? Yeah. How are you going to respond? Because it's all done. It's all done. You just have to step into Christ and allow Christ to move through you, but it's all done. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a whole new mindset. So some of the things that we take hold of, some of the things that we believe are Old Testament, which is not wrong in, in and of itself, but we must remember we're New Covenant, which is better promises, a more sure guarantee, one drop. You think about this. For Passover... Sorry, Danny, I know we were going to worship, but I'm on. <laughs> but you think about Passover. There was, what, 2 million people left, so maybe 600,000, 700,000 families. One lamb a household. That's an awful lot of lambs. They did have an awful lot of sheep. But that's, a, that's like, what, 600, 700,000 lambs? Can you imagine the smell of that throughout Egypt, the, the roast? But, the, you know, think of the number of sacrifices. And yet we have Jesus, one sacrifice, the Lamb of God. And his blood is sufficient for every sin, for every person, past, present and future. It's good, okay. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. So, you know, it's recognising what covenant are we living in because I think sometimes we're living Old Testament and new. And we need to stop and think, what has God actually done for me in here? Am I still living old? Is it still about jumping through hoops? Is it still about meeting conditions? Or is it about the fact that Jesus Christ is my qualification, that he's fully qualified me, that when God looks for me, he finds me in Christ, that I'm an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ? You know, like, where are we? What do we actually believe? And that's why this Goshen thing, there's this multiple harvest every 28 days. Why not? Recording in progress. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Have we got the aircon on, love? It is on. It is on. Yeah. So praise, you know, so we just need to stop and think. And with the Passover celebration, and I'm, I'm so, you know, like grateful but it's it's not so much about the passover celebration that the jews do it's about jesus our passover lamb and what he has done and and how we walk in the fulfillment of that so celebrate passover and we were going to celebrate passover today but um it's tomorrow anyway. So just take what I say today and go home and pray about it and seek the Lord and have communion yourself. Because the amazing thing is that Passover th feast that the Jews did do, whatever, that was annual, wasn't it? But I have the right to have a Passover meal with my Lord, communion with my Lord anytime I want. I don't have to wait for a feast. I can feast on Jesus anytime I want. There's so much that's changed. And when we recognise um, that the Father wants us, everything that he did was to draw us closer to him. Every, the, the feast that he, he instigated with Israel, everything, it was to draw them closer to him. Um, and it's, it's recognising it's all about relationship. It is all about relationship. And Passover is an appointed time. But I love the fact that I can have Passover communion with my God anytime I want. I can worship him. So there were seven feasts that God made. 
uh, appointed times with Israel and they coincided with seasons of seed time and harvest. And the feasts were called Moed, M-O-E-D, which is, uh, means an appointed time. And each feast had a prophetic purpose and each feast was fulfilled or to be fulfilled through Jesus Christ in the power of his shed blood. There were seven major feasts, four were in springtime, which would be autumn for us, and three were in autumn, which is our springtime. But the spring feasts were Passover, Passover was the very first one. And then it was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, and then the Feast of Weeks or of Pentecost. So they were the four spring feasts. The three autumn feasts were the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. But the Passover is the very first spring feast. And in Leviticus, and I'm not going back into the law, I want you to see what Jesus has done. Uh, Leviticus 23, verses 1 to 5. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The set feasts, the appointed seasons of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations, my set feasts are these. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation or assembly by summons. You'll do no work on that day. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in your dwellings. Now Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. There are set feasts or appointed seasons of the Lord that you shall proclaim. And the, first, the fifth verse says, On the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. So that's the one that is happening tomorrow. It's the first spring feast. And it's an amazing time where the Jews are reminded to look for the Messiah. You know, they hide that bit of matzo bread, that the, everything's ready, that they... They look for the Messiah. They're reminded about that. They're reminded that God caused death to pass over the homes that were anointed with the blood. But in John chapter 19, verse 14, let me just turn there. John 19, 14, when it talks about the Passover lamb and how all the households had to choose one four days before, um, the, pass, the, before the exodus. John chapter 19, verse 14, says it was the day of preparation for the Passover and it was about the sixth hour, about 12 o'clock at noon, and Pilate said to the Jews, see here is your king. So on the day of preparation, at the same hour that the lambs were being slaughtered for the Passover meal that evening, Jesus was being crucified. It all ties in with God's timetable, like it's just the most amazing thing. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, 1 Corinthians. See, what I find, like it's just what God does. In the Old Testament, he, Moses said to them, you have to get a lamb for the household. You have to choose the lamb. And it was about four days before it was to be um, slaughtered uh, and, and sacrificed. And they had to make sure it was perfect and it was blemish free. But our God has said, New Testament, God has said, I've chosen the lamb. He didn't leave it up to humanity. He said, I've chosen the lamb and it's my son. First Corinthians chapter 5 Verse 7, purge out the old leaven that you may be fresh dough, still uncontaminated, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So it comes back to Christ. God says, I'm going to choose the Passover lamb for the people of the New Testament. I'm going to choose it, and it is perfect. He is without blemish, and he is my son, Jesus, our Passover lamb. So these feasts... And these appointed times that God made with the Israelites, they're amazing and, and we can step into them anytime we want. But, but God's moeds, God's appointed times, and let me tell you, he has appointed times with you. God has appointed times with you, times just before a promotion, times to set you up for a breakthrough, times to change your financial situation, times to bring salvation into the family. God has appointed times for you. It's not just about the feasts, the seven feasts that the Israelites had. God, in his personal walk with you, as your Abba Daddy God, he says, I have an appointed time for you. When was the time that you got saved? 
That was God's appointed time for me to meet with Jesus Christ. There was an appointed time. There was an appointed time to be filled with the Holy Spirit. There was an appointed time to come out of a toxic relationship. There was an appointed time for, for my heart to be softened, for God to do something. There's these appointed times in our lives, but we don't necessarily look for them because we're so busy praying about them, we don't even realise that God and his love has already set us up for them. We're saying, God, do it. And God's saying, I've already done it. Just be aware. Keep your eyes on me. Look, see what I'm doing. But we're praying, God, I need a breakthrough. God, I need you to change my family. And I need this. I need God to change my family. God, I need you to do this. I need you to do that. But God's saying, in Jesus Christ, you already have everything. You've already got it all. But if you walk with me and stay in agreement with my word, things will change. What would it be like, instead of me worrying about, worries a sin, Danny's always telling me that, um, thinking about things like, well, what's going to happen? You know, I really need so-and-so in my family to get saved. What would happen if I really came into agreement with the, the verse in Acts chapter 16, which says that as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Yeah. So every time my, my son or whoever it is comes to mind, well, as for me and my household, they're going to serve the Lord. Yeah. Like that's the end of the story. Like there's no argument here. But we, we tend to push in and say, God, we need you to do this. How about we step back and say, God, I thank you. You've already made provision. You've already made the provision. You've already made the way. You already know how to touch the heart. You already know how to change the circumstance. You already know what to do. I'm just going to come into agreement with you and I'm going to stand on the rhema word of truth that you give me. How does that sound? Yes. Takes all the worry out takes all the stress out, takes all the care away, and you've delegated up. I love delegating up. God, this is your problem. I'm in agreement with you. As for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. God, I'm in agreement with you. Every need in my life is met according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. God, I'm in agreement with you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God, I'm in agreement with you that uh, Jesus has given me all authority over all serpents and scorpions and nothing shall by any means harm me. God, I'm in agreement with you. That's a kingly role. When you recognise that you decree the word of the God and establish his kingdom upon the earth. That's it. And I take authority right now over the spirit of witchcraft that's trying to come into this room and bind and break its power and cut it off at its source in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So these appointed times, God's got them for you for your business, for your finances, for your family, for you and your relationship with him. And that's, that's where God breaks into our timing and sets up his dimensional timing. That's when God injects himself into our affairs. That's when, you know, when Ab uh, Abigail, seriously, Abraham <laughs> even changed his gender. That's when Abraham... <sighs> had come back from the battle and was heading off to, to, into the king's valley, but Melchizedek cuts him off. The interception of God, the intervention of God in a human life. God wants to intervene. He set himself up to intervene. He injects himself into your affairs. There are God-given moments of destiny that we just kind of stumble into and think, oh my gosh. And then you realise, oh my gosh, this is where I'm meant to be. This is what I'm meant to be doing. I had no idea. And so we embrace it with purpose. Who's just stumbled into things? And then all of a sudden you realise, oh man, yeah, this is God. I, I must be the, me and Leah must be the only ones that stumble. We, we fall forward into the things of God. But you know, like you just sort of, it's a bit like Mr Magoo, you pray in tongues and Oh my gosh, look what God has done. Look how he set us up. Look what's happening. But he gives us moments of destiny that if we're, not, if we're not aware it's destiny, we can miss out. But he sets everything up to tell us, to let us know. It's where heaven brushes earth and changes earth in a way that will never be forgotten. In a way that will never be forgotten. 
a God-appointed moment accelerates purpose and destiny. Come on. Would you say that again, please? A God-appointed moment accelerates purpose and destiny. There's a speed that comes with the purpose of God. There's a speed that comes with an appointed moment. And an appointed moment for God's people is a separation between them and the people of the world. God steps in and he steps in between his people and the people of the world like he did with the Passover. I'm stepping in and I'm freeing my people from bondage to Egyptian harsh taskmasters and I'm setting them free. He steps in. And the last one, which we don't really talk about a lot, is judgment on other gods. Yeah. Judgment on other gods. Part of Passover was the judgment on other gods. And, you know, every time we take communion, we can ask for a judgment on, the, on, on other gods, on, on demonic spirits that are coming against, whatever it might be. But Jesus Christ said all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. All authority. And so we can stand in his authority like he's given us a blank check. And he says, my name is on that check and you can write it out for whatever you want. And you stand in my authority. I've given you my authority, power of attorney to use his name. And you can release justice, I'm not going to use the word judgment, but divine justice into situations and circumstances. You do not release it on people. No. It's not for people. But it is for, divine, for unjust situations and circumstances. A, a, a judgment of God for vengeance is mine, says God, I will repay. But we often, as Christians, are so righteous, we don't even think about the justice side of his throne. For God's throne is situated on righteousness and justice. And so, yes, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, God, forgive them. God, I forgive them. I release them. I ask you to touch them. I ask you to change them. I ask you to save them. I ask that they would be redeemed. Let them come under the fear of the Lord. We know all of those things to pray. But how about, but God, in this situation that is so unjust, I ask for justice to be released. Justice from your throne room. Justice from your throne room. Because that was part of Passover, was justice. And we need to, we need to take hold of this. In Exodus chapter 12, which is all on the Passover... Um, verses 11 to 14, it says, You will eat it thus, fully prepared for a journey, your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you'll eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Whose Passover is it? The Lord's. The Lord's. It's not the Jews. He's given it to them as a feast, but it's his Passover. And he says further on down, this is in verse 12, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. This is about the Lord showing his sovereignty, his power, uh, his covenant contract if you like with the Israelites but he's saying the Passover belongs to the Lord I am the Lord and judgment will be executed against Egyptian gods tonight it will happen as he says and so we need to understand the power of God that so often we hold back I don't know if I'm making sense, but it's almost like we hold the power of God back because we don't want to release the justice of God. We don't want to see... But I'm telling you, I want to see trafficking stopped. I want to see drug money averted back into kingdom causes. I want to see people set free. And the thing that happens with evil, because we don't stand against evil, is that the money continues to flow into evil purposes and it continues to grow. And God has called us to take hold of this world and to disciple the nations which means that we have to learn how to defund evil and fund kingdom purposes. Yes. And we can learn a lot of this from the Passover. Because said the Passover is mine. He says, I'm going to show my power. 
When was the last time the power of God was shown in your life? Hopefully today, yesterday, relatively close. But if you are actually living in Christ, and you are, and Christ is living in you, you carry both the glory and the power of God with you everywhere you go. Power to raise the dead, power to open blind eyes, power to heal the sick, power to heal families that are broken and tormented, power to stop demonic assault. You have the power to do anything that God calls you to do. You have his power. You carry it. You carry it within you. You carry his glory. You can do anything. I can do all things through Christ. Obviously not brain surgery. But spiritually speaking, whatever God asks me to do, I can do it because Christ empowers me. And that takes the limitations off, doesn't it? Because we limit ourselves sometimes. Even our prayers can be limited to what we think God can answer. We need to learn to pray big prayers, dangerous prayers, large prayers that will shake things when God answers them. And so he says, this is the Lord's Passover. He says, I am the Lord and judgment will be executed against the Egyptian gods. And they were told in verse 3, um, select, select the Passover lamb. The people were to select it, one for the household. And if there wasn't enough for a household or if there was not enough people in the household, they were to connect with the next, the next household. But God selected Jesus Christ as our Passover lamb. It wasn't about human selection. This is a divine selection. God says, you have, there is now new covenant, a new Passover lamb, and he is Jesus Christ, and he is my son. The pure, sinless, perfect sacrifice. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 22. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22. In keeping with um, the oath's greater strength and force, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better agreement, a more excellent, more advantageous covenant. Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant, a more advantageous one. And verse 25, therefore Jesus is able also to save to the uttermost. That means he can save completely. He can save to the... Finally, for all time, right through eternity, those who come to God through him, he is always living to make a petition to God and intercede for us. Always living to make intercession for us. But he is the one who can save us to the uttermost. Once you've met Jesus Christ as your saviour, then you don't need any other saviour. You don't need any other way to save you. Jesus Christ saves you to the uttermost. That means spiritually, physically, emotionally, financially, socially. It means professionally. It means in ministry. Jesus Christ saves you to the uttermost. It's perfect in every way. You don't need anything else it's the messiah it's christ he's done it Amen. hebrews chapter 9 verse 12 says jesus went once and for all into the holy of holies not by virtue of the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood having found and secured a complete redemption an everlasting release for us for if the mere sprinkling of unholy and defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls and with the ashes of a burnt heifer is sufficient for the purification of the body, how much more surely shall the blood of Christ, who by virtue of his eternal spirit has offered himself as an unblemished sacrifice to God and he purifies our consciences from dead works and lifeless obediences so that we can serve the living God. Jesus is our Passover lamb. You don't need any other saviour. He is the ultimate saviour. He is the ultimate redeemer. He is the ultimate in every way. It's Jesus Christ. And this, the Passover, back in the Old Testament, that, that one 
feast that they had that they have annually, but we can have any time. It is dynamic proof of God's presence, power and protection. It is dynamic proof of God's provision. And if that was the Old Testament, how much more for us? Because Jesus, the Lamb of God, came to take away the sins of the world. Right? Sins of the... Let me say something else. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Old Testament, sins were covered over, right? Mm -hmm, right. New Testament, mm -hmm. they're removed. Mm -hmm. They're removed. No so when don't come to me and tell me of my sins of the past because I don't remember them because God doesn't remember them. Come on. You know, and people have no right stirring up what's under the blood to bring condemnation or to bring... Can, whatever, whatever it is they bring, people have no right to bring up the past. It's under the blood. Come on, Jesus removed our sins from us. We, sh we are changed more and more. We're not under the law. We're under grace, which means sin does not have dominion over us anymore. Records wiped clean, like on, justified, just as if you'd never sinned. You know, so we've got to recognise that sometimes people love to tell us what we've done in the past mm. and how often we've done it mm. and how good we are at sinning. Mm. And don't you remember when? Mm. And quite frankly, you can say, no, I don't remember when because I'm not that person anymore. Come on. That's not who I am anymore. Apply. No longer applies. If you talk to God about that, he's going to tell you, uh -uh, it's not on the record. It's not on the record. It's been wiped clean by the blood of the Lamb. In, um, back in Hebrews, no, sorry, Exodus 12, and I'm probably a bit all over the shop, but I hope you get that Jesus is all that you need. Mm -hmm. Exodus 12. It says that in verse 11, you are to eat it, fully prepared for a journey. Your loins are girded, your shoes are on your feet, your staff's in your hand, and you'll eat it in haste. This is the Lord's Passover. When you take communion, when you have that time with God, are you ready to move forward? Mm -hmm. Are you ready for God to do a suddenly? Yeah. Or are you still parked there? waiting for God to do something but faith works faith takes action faith has as works attached to it and and God is saying here you can eat the Passover lamb but you've got to eat it ready to move because I'm going to do a suddenly God wants to do suddenlies in your life he wants to do suddenlies in how you live he wants to break through he wants to set things up for you he wants to bring heaven to earth in your life and so he wants to bring these things around and he's wanting to do a suddenly but if we're not prepared, if we're not ready to move, if we're sitting back saying, oh God, I hope it's you, I think it's you, maybe it's you, I don't know. And we're not, we're not really listening, we're not plugged in, we're not ready to go. Come on. You're not going to have the fullness of what the Father's got for you. And I want the fullness. Come on. That means we've got to be ready. There has to be an expectancy, an anticipation in our walk with the Lord that uh, maybe today... You know, that member in my family is going to get saved. Maybe today it's going to happen that the breakthrough is going to happen at work. Today. Today is good day. Today's, now is the... Today, now. <laughs> now is the now day of... That's it. So, you know, you've got to be ready to take possession. Yeah. See, in the Old Testament, they were getting ready to leave Egypt to move into possession. But we've already been given possession because God says, I've given you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Not the keys to the kingdom, but the keys of the kingdom, which means I can access any place in the kingdom of heaven I want because I've got keys of the kingdom of heaven. He's also said that I'm an heir of God. I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. That means that I have been given possession. Come on. You already have it all. Yeah. You already have it all. Yeah. Come on. Hallelujah. Yeah. That's worth shouting for. <laughs> Thank you. I receive the all, Father. You already have it all. He's given you everything, like everything Thank for you. life and godliness. 
Life and godliness, everything. And then he says, you know, and this is something I was reading in that book by Gregory Toussaint, Diamonds in the Desert. He said, everything that you have, all of your prosperity comes out of your soul. And I went, whoa, I have to think about that. But 3 John 2, above all things, I want you to prosper above all things. I want you to prosper. I want you to live in health even as your soul prospers. So the soul sets the limitation. So we've got to learn to what it is to have a prosperous soul. But that means a prosperous soul means that I know that I've got it all. That God doesn't withhold any good thing from, from the upright ones. He doesn't withhold anything from us. And he said, you seek first the kingdom of God and my righteousness and I'll give you all things will be added unto you. Like he withholds nothing. He says in Romans chapter 8, verse, oh, I don't know where it is. But I know it's in Romans chapter 8 because I've always got my bookmark in Romans chapter 8. Verse 32, God did not withhold his own son but gave him up for us all. Will he not also with Jesus freely and graciously give us all things? Yeah. All things are yours. All things are yours. And you know what really bugs me? I turned on Christian TV this morning. Should not do it. Should choose my programs. Because I was told that if I sent in X amount of money, I could have the Passover blessings. Guess what? Jesus Christ gave me the blessings. He is the He He gave it to me. I don't have to pay for it. That is a ripoff. That is manipulation. That is absolutely wrong. Jesus Christ has given me the blessings. And so the blessings of the Passover, the seven blessings that they talk about, you already have them. The Jews were looking for them. But you have them through Jesus Christ. I'm getting so... Come on, come on. So, I remember I, I mean, once years ago, and I was watching a certain program on Christian TV, and they said there are 58 specific blessings in the Word of God. And if you send me $58, $580, $5,800, if you send me this, you can have all of these blessings. And I'm a naive young Christian and I'm thinking, oh, I want everything God's got, you know? So I'm thinking, can I afford $58? And then the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and said, you, don't you dare send that money in. I've given it to you. Jesus Christ paid the price for you to live in the blessings of God. So for somebody to come along and tell you that you're lacking something, yeah, yeah. lie. Yeah. For somebody to come along and say, you can have this blessing, but it's going to cost you this amount, lie. Jesus Christ paid the price in his own blood. Jesus Christ said, I give you everything you need for life and godliness, which is natural living and spiritual living. Everything. Nothing is withheld from those who walk uprightly before God. Nothing. And the devil tries to get us to agree with him that I'm lacking wisdom. How can I lack wisdom when I have the spirit of wisdom? How can I lack wisdom when I have the mind of Christ? How can I lack wisdom when I can ask God who gives to me liberally the wisdom that I'm asking for? How can I lack when God says, if you need it, I'll give it? Lie. The lies that we believe. Church culture lies. Oh, you haven't prayed enough. Don't need to pray enough. I'm in a righteous relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that he paid for me. He ransomed me, paid for me with his own blood. I belong to him. I pray as I'm led. Sometimes maybe not as fervently as I should. Sometimes maybe not as awake as I should be. But it's not about how long you pray. And it's not about how many chapters of the word you know or you've memorized. It is about the depth of friendship or intimacy that you have with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. Don't let anybody ever tell you that you're not good enough, that you're not qualified enough, that you don't have this. You have it all because of Jesus. Come on, I agree. You need to get a righteous anger on the inside of you. 
that you've been ripped off. You've been ripped off. Whether it's been by church culture, whether it's been by wrong teaching, and whatever I teach you, go home and check it out. I pray for the spirit of truth. I pray that I be in the spirit of truth. But nobody has their act 100% together. That's why we need the grace of God. Um, you were talking about Exodus 12 where they were dressed and ready to leave bondage. And yeah, to we've gone. Promised land, right? And move forward into freedom. And then you move forward into that in, in Christ, in our new covenant, that we already have possession. And then I was seeing... Uh, the scripture that says, <laughs> that talks about communion, and when we're having communion, he says, you show forth the Lord's death till you come. Yeah. And we are clothed in his righteousness. And I was seeing how the shadow, the type, the, they're prepared to leave bondage, and they're dressed and ready to go, and they're partaking of the sacrifice the sacrificial, the lamb whose blood was on their doorposts. And then I was seeing that in the reality in the fulfillment in Christ and how inside of us we're already, we're clothed. We're clothed upon with Christ. We're clothed. We're in his righteousness. And when we take the elements, it says we do show forth yeah. that. It's like, it's like the, they called it the blood stain. We're, we're, the evidence is inside even our physical parts. And I just love it so much. That just, is it, we can't walk away from it. We can't, it can't be extricated from us. We're in it. He's in us. And it's, it's solid. Yeah. yeah. It's, solid. it's not something we're hunting for. It's already ours. Love it, love it, love it. If you just want to turn, we're just random. This is just random. Luke 24. Luke 24. So when you take communion, whether it's tonight or tomorrow, just really spend time with him, commune with him. And it says in verse 30, Luke 24, 30, it occurred, this is just after the walk of Emmaus, that as Jesus reclined at the table with them, he took bread and praised God and gave thanks and asked a blessing and broke it and was giving it to them when their eyes were opened and they recognised him and he vanished. I believe there's a time in communion when your eyes are opened, when you get a revelation, when... Um, you know, just your eyes are on and you instantly recognize, oh, Lord. And he shows you something. And then they said to one another in verse 32, weren't our hearts greatly moved and burning within us while he was talking with us on the road as he opened and explained the scriptures to us? And so, you know, expect a revelation, a rhema from the word of God when you get into these things. But then further on, in verse 45, he says, Jesus opened up their minds to understand the scriptures. I mean, what a prayer. Every time you open the word, Jesus, I just want to thank you that you are opening up my mind to understand you because you are the scripture. You are the word of God. And then in verse 49, it says, Behold, I'll send forth upon you what my father's promised, but remain in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. And that word, uh, tarry, remain, whatever it might be in your translation, in, in the Greek it's kathizo, which means to sit down. That actually means in the Greek, learn how to sit comfortably on a throne of spiritual authority from which you will govern. Learn to sit comfortably on a seat of spiritual authority from which you will govern. And then he gave them the power and the authority to govern. So when you tarry, what he's saying is, I want you to, to learn how to relax, how to be seated with me. Ephesians 2, 6, enthroned with him, seated with him in heavenly places. Learn how to sit comfortably on a throne of spiritual authority from which you will govern with him. 
And then he says you're going to be endured or clothed with power from on high. And that word endured is enduo in the Greek. And that means to put on. It means that you are completely covered by a substance that cannot be removed. You're covered with power from on high. It cannot be removed. It is inseparable to you. It is like a second skin anointing. It can, it's a permanent spiritual attire. You cannot, you cannot lose it. It's there. It's completely covered by a substance that cannot be removed. Second skin. In, 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 it's just, you can't be separated from it. You know, this is the amazing thing, and yet you've got people telling you, well, you're not anointed for this, and you can't do that. Lies. When it comes back to the truth of the Word of God, they're lies that people feed us to keep us constrained, to keep us restricted, to keep us um, from destiny, to keep us from releasing the power and the glory of God upon the earth, to keep us good little Christians that won't rock the boat. I remember once when I was going to another church and there was a minister from Malaysia who came out and his opening words were, no, it's so good to be here. His opening words weren't, thank you, pastor, for opening the pulpit to me. His opening words were, I'm not here to rock your boat. I'm here to sink it. And I loved it because he was coming out with revelation. He was coming out with things that could change the way we lived. It was just awesome. But, you know, but so often we get comfortable in the boat and we don't necessarily get out and walk on the water because it's comfortable in the boat. And we don't necessarily like it when the storms arise because Jesus is too comfortable in the boat and, he's, and he should be up doing something. But he's lying there thinking, well, you guys, I gave you the authority. I gave you the authority. Why aren't you doing it? Yeah, you know, we have been cheated. And there needs to be my phraseology a divine discontent that you have been ripped off of destiny, of family salvations and and unity that whatever it might be things that work you know like um like I, I know the devastation that the divorce in my family caused my children you know and it, i can see it affecting my grandchildren you know it's things like that but but we kind of accepted oh well that's life well it might be life but it's not heaven on earth and Jesus said, we are to call heaven to earth. We are to bring heaven to earth. God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we've got to recognize there are things in our lives that maybe are not heavenly. But God isn't going to necessarily do something about it because Jesus has already done everything that needs to be done. And we have to come into agreement and alignment and in faith with Jesus and release the power of the word of God or whatever the Holy Spirit tells us to do so that heaven is released and and things are changed and people look, my goodness, what's happened to you? What's happened to your family? What are these things? Why? You know, it's, and it's, it's all about Jesus Christ. And if he's not your first love, if he's not the one who you love more than anything else, we need to think about this because we can't afford to lose our first love in these times. It's not about the church you go to. It's not about who you are or what you do. It is about Jesus who died so that we can live. And he came to cause us to live a life that is more abundant. And that means abundant physically, abundant mentally, emotionally, socially, financially, abundant in family, welfare, whatever it might be, work. He came to give us life and life more abundant. It's all about Jesus. And he must be our first love. And when we lose sight of Jesus as our first love, we are in dangerous territory. Because it is about him. It is about him. There's so much more in Passover, but I think I'm done. But it is about Jesus.
just one of the revelations that I've come come to. I grew up in a church where we did actually keep all the Jewish festivals and stuff. And one of the revelations I came to as I was coming out of that is Passover was not just Passover. Directly after that were the days of unleavened bread. Yeah. And it's understanding the bread in that was to make new bread, they'd take a lump from the old, bre old bread, knead it into the new bread. But they've just got rid of their bread for a week, so now they've got to start all over again. Jesus is our fresh start. 2 Corinthians 5, it says that if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. We start again. We don't just have a fresh start once or twice a year. We have a fresh start every day with God. And so... Although sin had come back into your life and it builds up again, he's just like, fresh start. You're in me. Fresh start. And we start again. Amen. Good word, Elise. Elise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The other thing to recognise in this chapter is the wealth transfer. Yes. But just because you're a Christian doesn't mean the transfer will come to you. It's about stewardship, right handling of it. And in, in Exodus 12, the Lord gave the people favour in the sight of the Egyptians so that they could give them what they asked. And sometimes I think we don't ask. What is the Lord wanting you to ask of him or of people? And it's not about wealth for wealth's sake. It is about for the establishment of the body of Christ. I support, I personally support three churches in Africa and they are constantly wanting money for food or for school or for education or whatever. Uh, one of the men have just died, so the pastor's taken on another half a dozen kids um, and they just can't seem to get ahead. They can't seem to get their faith to sort of like crack um, they still look to the Western Church and it's not the Western Church that's their provision. God is their provision through Jesus Christ. But it's getting them to get out of the church culture that they've been raised in, which is the Western Church will provide for you. And so we, we send them teachings and we, we help them to stand and, um, you know, like rent some land, plant some seed, grow some veggies for the children. Don't just sit back and wait for the money to come in from me or whoever else you've got on your list. Um, so it's, it's recognising there's a whole lot of different things. But let's come back to the basics. And I feel like I'm a great one to be talking at the moment. But through Jesus Christ, not only did death pass over you or pass over the Israelites, but you've been given eternal life. You'll never die you've been given eternal life. The earth suit might kind of fold up, but you've been given eternal life. So much more than just the spirit of death passing over the household. As for you and your family, they will serve the Lord regardless. Because of Jesus Christ, you have the opportunity to live in divine health. When they left Egypt, there was not one sick or one feeble person amongst them. There was not even poor because they had stripped the Egyptians of their wealth. So they were healthy and wealthy. That was, I think, Psalm 107, somewhere around there, Psalm 105. 105, 107, somewhere in there. So think about the areas of your life where you are not living in the fullness of what you know Jesus Christ came to give you. It could be health, it could be finances, it could be toxic relationships, it could be anything. It doesn't matter what it is. The thing is, Jesus Christ paid the price for you to be set free. Jesus Christ transferred you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Jesus Christ did it. The power of his blood did it. You lack nothing. And so we need to to, like, like for me, I'm speaking to my body, commanding healing to manifest because I'm not commanding healing to come to me. I know I live in the healing of Christ and I am rebuking sickness that has no right to attach itself to me. The same with pro poverty or debt. You have no right. Jesus took my, our poverty on the cross so that we could live in his prosperity. 
And that's not just talking spiritual riches, that's talking financial prosperity. You lack nothing. Absolutely nothing. And the gifts that God has put in you, like whether it's uh, prophecy like Terence or whatever it might be, whatever gifts they are, they need to be sharpened, they need to be honed, they need to be um, you know, upskilled by the Holy Ghost so that the words that you release from your mouth will penetrate the hearts of the people that listen to you so that everywhere the sole of your foot treads, God gives it to you so that like Peter who walked down the street, the sick were healed. This is the reality of who you are in Jesus Christ. This is what you carry. And don't let anyone tell you that you carry anything less or anything minor or that you miss anything because you carry the abundant life of Jesus Christ. You carry the glory of God, the anointing of Jesus, the authority of his name. You carry it all. And everywhere you go, the heaven backs you. God's government backs you. It's time to rise up. Yes, it, is. Yes, sir. it is time to rise up. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you where this came from. I came from the pit of hell. But there was an assignment taken out against me, which I was unaware of, blissfully unaware. Doesn't pay to be unaware. Just on two years ago, remember when I, I fell down the stairs and had the head injury? And then I had the moon boot for so many months. And then I had my arm in a sling for so long. And then I've got this. It all started back at a particular time just before I was promoted in the spirit realm. And it was to stop the promotion. Now, I've still been promoted and I take my place and I'm recognised internationally. However, it's been a battle. But if I had recognised at the time there would have been a grace instead of a grind. So be aware. What I'm saying is be aware of the God opportunities of what God is wanting to do in your life. You know, because you can get caught up in just, well, I've got to do this, this, and this, and this is what I'm called to do, and da-da-da. And we are not necessarily paying attention to what the Holy Spirit is wanting to tell us. But looking back, I can see where the Holy Spirit was telling me. It was like when my my little 18-month-old son fell out the window 13 feet down onto concrete and I'm blissfully folding up the towels on the kitchen table and he's playing in the boys' bedroom on the bunk beds and the Holy Spirit said to me, go upstairs and shut the bedroom window, the boys' bedroom window. And I said, yes, Lord, I will. I'll just finish folding up these towels and I'll carry them, I'll put them in the, you know, linen press and then I'll shut the window but in the process of my yes Lord I will but my son fell 13 feet down onto concrete and was not expected to live but God did an amazing thing God did an amazing thing and even the nurse said to me when I walked in the next morning somebody was here tonight and instead of dying he lived and instead of being three months in hospital it was three days and he'd broken his, um, no, his neck. And there was just a little blue ring right around his neck, but it was totally healed. Yeah. Right? But I missed it. I missed it. Yes, Lord, I will. But common sense said, well, just finish folding the towels and put them away and then you can. Don't listen to common sense. Listen to the Holy Spirit. It's all about timing. It's all about listening to the Lord and it's about being aware. And now I know where it's come from. Mm -hmm. I'm working on dealing with this. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but all of us have got areas where we've missed life, where we've missed a promotion, whether it's in the spirit realm or financially or whatever, we've missed something. And I'm saying right now, God is wanting to restore those areas that you've missed. God is wanting to bring them back. God is wanting to say, I restore the finances that were stolen. I restore the opportunities at work that were stolen. I want to restore lost family relationships. I want to restore everything that's been stolen. We're entering into a season of restoration. And so, Father God, right now, in the name of Jesus, we make a demand upon covenant 
and we release the word restore and we ask you to restore everything that the locusts have eaten. We ask you to restore everything that's been lost and stolen from us over the years. We ask you to restore even if it's been through our own disobedience or our own ignorance, Lord. We ask you to restore simply because you're our Abba Daddy. And so right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, I speak to the satanic banks. I speak to the satanic areas that have hijacked the blessings, the opportunities, the relationships, the finances. I speak to those hijacked areas, and I command you to release them in Jesus' name. Be released in the name of Jesus. Let the fullness of restoration, the fullness of recompense, and the fullness of restitution be released upon God's people now in Jesus' name. We receive it. Receive it. Receive it in the name of Jesus. And start to believe for monthly harvests. Doesn't have to be agricultural. It can be monthly profits in your business, Lynn. It can be monthly profits that you've never had before. Start to ask God, I want, that, that I want the supernatural. Move me into it in Jesus' name. Amen.